right, I want to thank everyone for coming today. I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Jay Gilmer. He is uh, with the Hunt County. Hunt County Beekeepers Association. And more people than you realize do things with bees. My brother-in-law does, a friend of mine's husband does, and so it's like, it's a lot more widespread than there, I think There's most. a lot more than <laughs> what I ever dreamed when I got into it. And One bee. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I see it go by. I wish people could take care of the wasps that come out here, you know? We get yeah. lots of wasps. I don't yeah. put any bees out here, but I do um, get wasps. Well, we <laughs> might set up a hive. <laughs> Um, and uh, Jay has been here, I think, all his life, I think. Born and raised here. here. And uh, I worked at L3 before retiring in 22 and doing beekeeping full, as a full-time, uh, uh, more than a hobby, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, this month's uh, sponsor is Chip Cole. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jay. Hello. Uh, I was born and raised here. L3, E-Systems. LTV, it has fed me all my life here in Hunt County. Uh, whether I was doing that or selling bees or putting rain gutter up as I used to do. Uh, but it's, I enjoy being from here. I enjoy the, being able to tell a story about sea bees, being able to tell a story about our knees, different things like that. Uh, so anyway, uh, I am a, member of the Hunt County Beekeepers Association. Actually, I'm the president of the Hunt County Beekeepers Association. Uh, we started in 2000, no, in 20, excuse me, 2020. Uh, the first year we kind of had a rough go of it, but after that, we kind of kicked in. Uh, and I hadn't figured out how to get out of that president slot yet. <laughs> but we'll get there. Uh, but. One of the things, we like to educate the members of youth and our community. That's one of the reasons I'm here today. Uh, we want everybody to learn about bees. Uh, we have monthly club meetings, and we bring in guest speakers each month. Uh, we'll bring in, there's a husband-wife team that comes in. They'll come in a couple of times a year, but he's got a master's in beekeeping and a master's in gardening. So they play very well together. Uh, and they're very knowledgeable, and we bring them in. We bring speakers from Lamar County Beekeepers Association. Uh, we bring them in from uh, Collin County. We try to just get different people that kind of specialize in certain aspects of it, and we try to keep it with whatever we're doing the next month or so, let them come in and talk about that and kind of educate the members with it. Uh, we do have field days. They are open to the public. Uh, so far, we've done it once a year. Uh, we do them out at my place. And I'll have somewhere around 100 hives out there at the time normally. And we fix hamburgers and we bring them in and we teach them everything from here's what a bee looks like, here's a beehive, to actually getting in and helping us do splits. In other words, taking one beehive and making two or three beehives out of it and installing queens in them. Uh, we teach them how to make queens, but we start at the basic. We start at, here's how you light a smoker. That's one of the hardest things beekeepers learn to do is light a smoker. <laughs> and keep it going. <laughs> oh, But we do that. We support our youth working with 4-H and FFA groups as they let us. Uh, the FFA, when they do uh, they're auctions, yearly auctions. There's several of them that will donate a hive to them so that they can sell it with it. Uh, we've got a new ag teacher that's joined the club, so that's going to be real interesting. He's going to help us get more involved with the ag side of it, uh, or the FFA side of it. 4-H, uh, I spoke at several of their uh, youth camps in the summer uh, and different things. So we try to educate them all. Uh, these are some of our guest speakers. She works at Texas Bee Supply over in Blue Ridge. Uh, he's a member of, and was president of the Lamar County uh, Bee Club. And then these are some of the pictures from the day in the bee yard. So you, we all get out there, you see a bunch of marshmallows. <laughs> and they'll be jumping around and we'll holler, all the clean bee suits go over here, all the dirty bee suits go over here. 
And that way we get them separated as far as here's our experienced and here's our newbies. Uh, but we have a good time. We feed them good hamburgers. My son-in-law cooks them and I hadn't had any complaints with them. <laughs> oh. So when you talk about the bees, each hive has only one queen. You may see one box, two box, three boxes tall, but that's a high, that is one hive if, it's, if they're stacked. Uh, and they have one queen. And I bet you if I hit that, TV's too bright, isn't it? Can y'all see the queen here? Uh, can you tell the difference in her? See, see how, let me get on this side. See how long her abdomen is, or her tail? Uh, then right here is a lot shinier and it'll be bigger. Uh, we mark a lot of the queens. And the way we do it, we take a little dot of paint. Take a paint pen. And we'll mark her right here, and we'll put the color of the year. There's five different colors. So if it, year one is the same color as year six, year two the same as seven. And that way it helps us to find her, but it also helps us to age her. So we know how long she's been in there. Uh, and she will live, she may live one day because they may not accept her when I put her in. Or they may... Sometimes they'll think that paint's a defect, and they'll get rid of her. Uh, but she'll normally leave, live two to three years, normally. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the bees in the hive are worker bees, or they're females. And then they live approximately 45 days in the spring and early summer. They do that because as they're going out and foraging and coming back, they're wearing out their wings. They literally shred their wings and fall out of the air. Uh, 10 to 20% of the bees will be drones and they will be there from early spring until the start of fall uh, or to mid fall. And their only goal in life is to mate with virgin queens. They go up, we, we always joke about it and say they go up to the cloud, uh, drone cloud and they sit up there and smoke their cigars and wait on a queen to fly by. Uh, but at the, at the onset of winter, they kick the drones out. They provide nothing else to the hive other than they eat the honey and pollen and mate with queen. And it's a one shot, one done because once they mate, then it kills her, or kills the drones. Now when a queen goes on its mating flight, it will mate with anywhere from 10 to 20 to even 30 or 40 drones. The more drones it mates with, the more sperm, the better mated the queen is, and the longer it will last in the hive laying eggs. So once she uses up all the sperm that she gets from her mating flights, then they'll replace her. They'll kill her and they'll grow no queens. So the queen bee, she lays eggs. She will lay up to 2,000 eggs a day in the springtime and early summer. Uh, when it starts getting hot though, she'll start slowing down. Uh, she regulates the hive activity and well-being by emitting pheromones. So they know where she's at at all times. And we think about the queen bee, you know, that's the, that's the queen, you know, she rules the roost. She doesn't really rule the roost. The worker bees rule the roost. So when she lays her eggs, she will lay drone eggs or she'll lay worker eggs. And that's based on what size cell that the worker bees uh, build. So a drone or a drone cell will look like a 22 shell sticking out. You know, if you ever open up boxes, 22 shells, you can see that dome shape. That's the way the brood looks on a drone brood. On worker bees, it's a little bit smaller diameter, 
and it's flat across the top once it, they cap it. Uh, and like I say, she lays whatever egg they tell her to lay. And if they decide that she's not doing what she's supposed to, they will kill her and they'll take an egg and start feeding it. I'm going blank. <laughs> uh, royal jelly. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Uh, they'll start feeding it royal jelly. Well, every egg gets royal jelly for the first day after it hatches into a larva. But the ones they want to make queens out of, they feed it royal jelly up until they cap it. And they'll cap it in seven to nine days. That way she grows bigger. Uh, and she'll, they decide when they want a queen. Not the queen. So, and swarming, once uh, the worker bees start to making replacement queens, the original queen stops laying. She trims down so that she can fly again because when she's in laying mode, she can't fly. I say she can't. She can fly a foot or two, but that's about it. So she'll trim down, and then when they swarm, the queen will leave and take about half the bees, and they'll go find another place. And then the replacement queens that they've already laid, started have them building, will take over. Worker bees, they're truly the workers. <laughs> they uh, clean house when they first come out. Uh, then they start feeding the larvae as nurse bees, then their attendants to the queens, then their house bees, then their guard bees, and then their foragers. So that's the different phases of a worker bee. So as they get older, then they mature into a different job. Uh, the last one being the foragers. Uh, and then that's where they start losing their, spreading their wings when they're flying in and out. They also, if it's hot in the summer, they will fan their wings to draw air in and cool the hive. And if it's in the winter time when it's cold, they cluster and then they generate heat by fanning their wings inside the hive. And they will keep that hive anywhere from 85 to 95 degrees year round inside the cluster of it. It may be freezing cold and what they do if once they are clustered in the winter and it's cold, as the outer bees start to get cold and tired, they rotate in and they're just continually rotating and keeping the hive warming. The queen will be down on the inside and they're keeping her the right temperature. Drones, they're the only males and they have one job, reproduction. This is what we like to enjoy, uh, honey. Honeybees made 125 million pounds of honey in 42. That's a bunch of honey. Uh, approximately 47 pounds per hive. Now this year, they didn't do that, not in our area, because of the rain that we had in early spring. Normally you think spring brings flowers and that's what the honey comes from. But the rain washes out the nectar out of the flower. And then it takes that flower three to four days to bring enough nectar back in in order for the bees to be able to draw nectar out. Well, what did it do this spring, all spring? About every three or four days it rained. So therefore we were having to feed and they just didn't make as much honey this year. Uh, the pollen's what is what helps with your allergies. They say eat honey for your allergies. Well, it's actually the pollen that's particles that are in the honey that's helping your allergies. Royal jelly that I talked about a while ago. Some believe it has medicinal pur purposes or properties. Beeswax, you can make candles, polishes, cosmetics. Uh, my wife makes lotions and then uh, lip gloss. Propolis, it's at the antibiotic of the hive. It's what helps them if something gets in a disease. The propolis kind of helps them with it. Uh, but you can also, y'all remember making, or remember uh, monkey's blood, the tincture of iodine? Well, you can make a tincture out of the propolis. It takes about three to four months to do it because it has to sit in alcohol for so long. But you can make a tincture out of it and it's got 
the medicinal purposes with it. The venom is used in apitherapy. If you look, they've had they've done uh, apitherapy on like somebody's chest that may have chest cancer or breast cancer, and they they literally let the bees sting them there, uh, so that they can get the medicinal properties, healing properties out of it. I've got arthritis in my hands. In the wintertime, they get stiff. In the summertime, when I'm working with the bees, most of the time I work without gloves. And I do it for a reason. I can feel them, and I don't squish them. But I also, they sting my hands, and my arthritis is better in the summertime. Uh, so I can tell you the venom helps some on arthritis. Now, it's not prolonged because I need them to sting it ever so often to keep it going. Uh, the greatest economic impact of honeybees is pollination of agriculture products. Every year, over half of the commercial bees in the United States go to the almond fields in California. Uh, it's a lucrative business. They pay $225 to $250 a hive to have them there for about 60 days. But if you didn't have the bees there, you would not have a single almond. They have to pollinate the almond trees in order to get the almonds. Uh, it's a $20 million business. So honeybees are important to us. Uh, when you start to look at your, you know, what, how does honey, honeybees affect my food today? Can I make it without honeybees? Well, if you take your plate and you divide it in thirds, at least a third of it you wouldn't have if there wasn't honeybees pollinating for you. Uh, and it could be as much as two thirds, depending on what you're eating. Uh, the hay for the cows, the feed for the cows, all that requires pollination. Now there's other pollinators out there, but the bees are the most prolific pollinators that we have. Uh, we have three types of beekeepers. We've got the commercial beekeeper. They have 500 hives or more. Uh, the pollinators, wholesale honey producers, they're the ones that go out to California and back. If you want to know how many goes out there, about 450 hives per truckload. So that'll tell you how many, when you see a truck, that's how many bees are going by you. Uh, the Stroops here in town, I'm not sure how many he has right now, but I'm gonna say he's got it in excess of 25 or 30,000 hives. Uh, they're in Caddo Mills area. Uh, Jacob Pullen's got about 10,000 hives, I think. Uh, Blue Ridge, Blake, uh, can't think of Blake's last name. There's no, he's probably got 50 or better. So it's, uh, there's several in this area that do it. It is a very lucrative business when you get to that level. Uh, when I started out in bees, that's what I was gonna do in my retirement. <laughs> Can you imagine how little time I would have? Uh, but after a couple of years, I had 30 highs and I thought, I gotta have about 450, 500 highs before I can send a truck. That's a lot more money investing. Uh, it's not a cheap hobby. Uh, if you wanna get into it, you're looking at two hives to start normally, a bee suit, your smoker, your hive tool. Well, I just sold you about $1,000 worth of equipment, bees. So it's not a cheap hobby to get into, uh, but it does a whole lot for us. Uh, Sideliners, which is basically what I am, uh, typically 100 to 200 hives. They're honey producers, wax products, and then the other one in there that I do, I raise and sell bees. So when you want to get into the bee business, you come see me, I sell you bees. Uh, I also, if you've got land that, say you've got five to 20 acres, and you want to get it in ag exemption for your taxes, I do that service. I put my bees on your place for so much a year and I take care of them, then you get the ag valuation on it. Uh, if you want to know how much that is, take whatever your property value, if you've got an acre of land, figure out what it is per acre, 
that you're paying, which is probably $1,000 a year or close to it, if you've got it in ag use, now you back down to 20 to 30 to 40 dollars an acre. So it makes a lot of difference with it. Uh, hobbyists, they're typically less than 30 hives. They want honey for their family and their friends. Everybody wants to have honey so they can give it or sell it to their friends, and their friends all want the honey. Uh, they want the wax <laughs> products. They want their gardens pollinated. Uh, and then there's other hive products that we've talked about. Is that all? Did I get to the end of it? Oh, there we go. Uh, our monthly meetings, we meet, if you'd like to come, we'd love to have you come out. Uh, we meet the second Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock at the American Legion over here on Moulton Street. Right over here. Uh, except for this month. This month it's going to be the third Thursday. We couldn't get the room. Uh, but this is typically second Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock every month. Uh, each month we learn about different plants that are good for the bees. So we've got a plant of the month speaker and they do research and they say, okay, here's the plants that the bees are on this month and here's what's benefiting them. Here's what you need as far as water and all for the plants. And then we have our special education topics presenters. Uh, we did this presentation is about two months old. We did the preparing your hive for spring. It's like any other business. Even as a hobbyist, you've got to say, okay, it's August, July, August. Now I've got to prepare the bees so they'll be ready in the springtime, get them ready to go through the winter. Uh, so it's things like that really help them to understand what we've got to do. Uh, and then sometimes we just do a Q and A session. Instead of bringing the speaker in, we just sit down and we talk and let everybody ask the questions that they've got going on. Training. We have our annual field day where we invite the public to come out and learn in the bee yard. As I said earlier, we talked about lighting the smoker, uh, introduction to a beehive, uh, how to do an inspection. A lot of people don't know how to find a queen when they first start, so we teach them how to find the queen. Uh, then we feed everybody. And then we have time that everybody can just network with others. Uh, the last two years we've had either between 40 and 50 people at the bee yard day. So. And our monthly meetings, we normally run about 30, 25 to 30. Uh, and I don't think I said earlier, I'm also on the board of directors for the Lamar County beekeepers up in Paris. And it's a little bigger. We'll run about 50 a month, between 40 and 50 a month up there. And we also are... We didn't get to do it this year because of the rain, but we try to do a bee yard day up there, and then they come down here and we go up there and stuff to work with them. Again, we do community education, working with the Hunt County Extension Office up here quite a bit as far as working with the 4-H group and doing things with them. Uh, they have a fourth graders Agriculture Day, Hunt County does. And they bus in all the kids from all the schools in the county. And we go up to that and we set up a booth there for them to come by. Uh, that gets kind of exciting because you've got a class comes through. So anywhere from 10 to 20 to 25 kids come through. You've got 10 minutes to tell them about bees, take questions, and then they honk the horn and they go away. Oh. And then you look up, here comes the next ones. <laughs> so, so every 10 minutes, they're honking a horn to move. <laughs> but it is very neat. And you'd be surprised at the kids that come in that have, their parents have bees, and they can tell you about the bees. They really work with them. Uh, I have had bees over on uh, Dr. McNew's place. I don't know if y'all know Dr. McNew. He does the, or did the braces for all the kids in town. Uh, but I looked up one day, I was working on his bees, and here come three little marshmallows coming out there. And they ate six to 10, I think, so, or they just, it's his grandkids. Well, they came down, they wanted to see the bees. And 
I said, yeah, and I, I was just sitting there working with them. And uh, I started pulling them out. And they started saying, there's a drone. There's the queen. They were studying about it in school. And we spent about an hour and a half or two hours just sitting at them, identify it and talking and letting them tell me about bees, a lot of it. Uh, so these, that's where I want to get into some of the schools and just kind of introduce them to them and help talk to them with them. Uh, and then I did do the morning Rotary Club uh, with them. I went through it a lot faster here. Y'all didn't ask a lot of questions. I'm used to a lot of questions. We'll take all the questions. You got one right here. A couple of years ago, I know that the, uh, there was, I can't remember what it was, but it seemed like the, the bee population was dwindling. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, there were scientists saying, hey, we've got to wake up and get the bee population back. Because if they go, we're gone within the next two, three years. Yes. Uh, uh, what was going on with this? Well, one of the things with it is what is the fastest growing crop in Texas right now? Asphalt. So they're moving into their territory. They're getting their flowers. They're getting their ag products. So that's one thing that hits. Uh, every year in the nation, we'll lose about 30% of the bees. But we make a lot of bees every year, too. I mean, I make, I think last year I bought. Four them six, 24 hives, and turn around and made another 100 hives out of those 24 doing splits. So I make more, I make more bees with it. Uh, what you will lose typically, if you're a hobbyist, you'll lose 40 to 50 percent of your hives a year. When you get into sideliner and into uh, commercial, you'll lose about 20 percent, 25 percent. Maybe that 30 uh, percent. Just because we are a little bit more diligent to take care of the bees, treating them for mites, which mites are, they hit, oh, about 20 years ago, I think, is when they actually hit the U.S. And they can take out a hive pretty quick if they get into it. So we treat them a couple of times a year. And how do you do that? Uh, Oxalic acid is the way I treat, uh, which is wood bleach, basically. Uh, we put it in a uh, oxalic acid, electrizer. Uh, it gets hot, the steam comes out, it goes, we put it in the hive, have a going in the hive, and that gets you a real good kill ratio with it. Uh, Apivar, there's other types of medications basically that you put in there. Uh, you have to watch when you're putting in APVAR and different types like that and not do it when you got the honey super on. You can't let it get in the honey. I know we've heard about, a lot about the Africanized bees and that. How do you, I mean, I know you can tell the difference between a regular honey bee and an Africanized bee, can't you? So what do you do? It's just a, it's a different trait that's in the African bee. You got within bees, just like cattle, you got Italian, you got Russian, you got African. There's different types of, or different breeds of bees. So when the African bees came over, they came up through Mexico. When they first came in, they were pretty well 100% Af African bees. And it's not that they're any different as far as if they sting you. The difference is they're super aggressive. So they will, instead of getting one sting, you get a hundred sting or two hundred stings. That's what will do it. Any bees, if you get that many stings, will do it, whether they're Africanized or not. But it's the temperament that the Africanized bees have. Now then, they've been in here so long now that most of your feral bees have a little bit of Africanized in it, but it's so weak now that they're not near as aggressive. So when I go to get bees from some place, if I go, uh, as far as like they get in somebody's house or in a tree or something, uh, 
you kind of want to walk in with your suit on and see how they're doing. <laughs> and you can tell pretty quick for hot. What we call hot is when they're coming after you. Uh, so you, I tell new beekeepers, sometimes I go out there just like this to work the bees. But I go out there other days and the same set of bees, they're hot, they're mad. They're like any other animal, it just depends on the day. Depends on the weather, uh, the time of day. Uh, so I tell all my beekeepers, you have to go buy a new suit, a good suit. Don't skimp money on a suit. Well, this has been working. I said, it's working good today. But the first time you go out there and you get into a hot hive, they can get you real fast if you're not careful. Uh, we have some beekeepers that are allergic to bees. And you'd think common sense would say we probably don't have bees, but I've got some that they've got bees and they've got their EpiPen in their pocket. Uh, and we've had to use one or two of them before. You can get stung sometimes. Uh, mine's a triple layer, so it's pretty thick, and it's but it's got holes in it. It's a mesh triple layer, so that I can get some air through it in the summer when it's hot. Uh, they can get through it sometimes. If your arm's sweaty and it kind of sticks to it, then they can kind of go through it sometimes. But for the most part, you don't. Uh, but there's always that chance. So if you're allergic to bees. You want your EpiPen if you're going to be doing it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Is there a, an average space, acreage that you put how many boxes on? We, we figure uh, two acres per hive. Two acres. That's what they will normally pollinate and take care of them. Uh, in the state of Texas, the minimum requirements to get ag valuation is five acres. So if you've got five acres in a house, then you gotta have another you gotta have six in a house. Because they're gonna take an acre out and say this is an ag use, it's a house. Uh, but for five acres for ag valuation, you gotta have six hives in the state of Texas. In Hunt County. Okay. It varies per county. And when you truck them to that one, you're, you're when, when we're trucking them out to California, California we're putting a hive per... Do you truck them only at night time? We try to, we pick them up at night. Uh -huh. We try to go as far as we can and keep it, but we, most of those will put a watering system of some type to help keep them cool while they're traveling because in you can't 19... get to California in 12 hours. Yeah, in the 1960s, I knew a man who went to Wyoming. Mm -hmm. So they stay cooler. And, and so I was wondering if they still did it that way they, found other ways to take care of them. No, they, they try to travel at night as much as they can. You load them at night normally because all the bees are in the hive. They're not out foraging. So yeah. you get all the bees loaded on the truck and then you put your net on it. Uh, you would stop at a pasture. I don't know if he made pre-arrangements, but anyway, he would stop at a pasture and let them out. Let them out. And, and they may do it. And I haven't got into that yeah, side of it that going. far. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do know they put watering systems on them a lot of times, uh, okay. but they may be doing some of that stopping also. So I think that's probably something they uh, thought of. Yeah. The uh, now, then, one of the things that's interesting, used to, they'd go to California, they'd come back here, they'd get to honey. Then they'd take them up to North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Washington State, and do the pollination there, and they'd bring them back every time, you know, and go back and forth. So what they've done now is, I don't know that they have the honey extraction plants there in California as much for the ones from Texas going, but they have bought honey extraction plants up in South Dakota, North Dakota, so that they don't have to come back. They just go up there, and then in the wintertime, all these potato warehouses that are up there, uh -huh. somebody got smart and said, hey, I'll rent you my potato warehouse to put your bees in and I'll keep it 40 degrees all year long and certain humidity for you. So they can put the bees in there and they know that if it's what the temperature is gonna be in the building, they know the humidity, 
So they, they can calculate how much sugar they need to put on them, and they just put them in there, they close the doors up, and then they don't get them back till it's time to go to California again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it's, you know, and that's become a big business. I think they charge them anywhere from five to $10 a hive, and I may be off a little bit, but it's not a lot for hive, but they're storing thousands of hives for them. Yeah. <laughs> so it adds up. So when they're not using their potato barns for potatoes, they're putting bees in them. And then they tell me that it's become such a good business, they're even building extra barns just for the bees. So that goes back to that $20 billion business that we talked about. Okay. Right, yeah. And you said you were born here. Mm -hmm. And so I just have to, I was born in Greenville as well. Okay. And as, as a child, and then we moved to Commerce. Um, so as a child, I can remember my dad bringing me over to, it was called Rice. Mm -hmm. Rice? On 24 and 34, or and yeah, 24 and 34, where it's, 224 and 34, where it splits right there. Uh -huh. Thurston Rice. And they gave us tours. Mm -hmm. Thurston was a sideliner, and he raised bees, and, and, or he had bees in order to have honey. So he produced honey every year. So, but that's, I've got several that, no Thurston, and then I've got a couple others to do it. I Let me get know, up here. Yeah, yeah, it's Thurston Rice. <laughs> yeah, his boys were my age. We went to school together. Yes, ma'am. When they swarm and mm -hmm. split, will the old queen be replaced when they get to wherever they're going, or do they? She can be if she's get depends on her age. Okay. Well, so when when they split is when they run out of room in their hive when they get too full. They can keep the same queen for a little while. And sometimes, if some, when they start preparing for the swarm, there may be four or five queens that are in there that haven't mated yet. Sometimes some of those will go with the queen. So in a swarm, if you catch it, you always want to look because you may have a few extra queens in it that you can split them into different hives. Mm -hmm. So when I do my splits. I thought I saw one in your picture. One queen? It, it, it may have been, I hadn't noticed it. Uh, it was up, up further on that way, yeah. and I went, well, where's the rest of that? <laughs> uh, we did, in our class, not this year, last year, we were out there going through and doing splits. And one of them hollered and said, hey, here's a virgin queen. And I went over there and I caught it with a queen clip, and we started looking. I think we found five or six virgin queens in it, along with the original queen. So instead of doing one split out of that, I got five or six splits out of it. Uh, so that's, and a queen's $50 to me. So <laughs> every time I find an extra, oh, there's another 50, here's yeah. another 50, here's another 50. Your hobby was <laughs> absorbing it. Yeah. So how do you, uh, I guess, uh, detract the, uh, the wax from the honey? I mean, without destroying it all. What, how, how does that work? So I've got a, decapper that I use, which is two rollers that you can push the frame to, through, and it's got spines on little spines on it, and it punches holes in the caps. And then I put it in a centrifuge, basically. Just like they spin the blood down, you know? But we're, it's for the honey and frames. I've got a three-frame extractor that you do like this. The big time boys, they have a 20 or 30 or 100 frame extractor that's motorized. That, uh, and they've got the automatic decappers and does, stuff. Does it like separate the honey it, from it, the wax? It pulls the, well, what it does, it just punches holes in the, it's, there's caps, what we call caps. So when they get it ready and the bees get it to 17% humidity, you can check it all day long and it's going to be right at 17% humidity once they cap it. God gave them that knowledge, here's how you do it. Uh, but once it's capped, then you need to come in, you can take a knife and you can cut the caps off across the top, or you can take a roller and just punch holes in the caps. Uh, or like my uh, deal, I can push it down in it and pull it out and get both sides at the same time. 
So I catch the honey and the cappings in that bucket. Then when I put it in the extractor, I'm gonna get some wax because it's gonna fall off. I'm gonna get pollen, I'm gonna get everything in with the honey. And then when it comes out, I've got a stainless steel screen that lets it go through and catch the big parts. It doesn't get everything, but it gets the majority of it. Uh, and if you don't have that, you can still put it in a five gallon bucket. And when it sets overnight, all the, everything floats to the top, the honey's at the bottom. So all the bee parts, all the wax, all the, a lot of the pollen, not all the pollen goes up because it's so fine and stuff, it'll go, it stays with it. But we separate it. Basically, we let it fill up and then we drain the bottom of the bucket to let it drain down. And it never biodegrades, right? The honey never gets bad. Never gets bad. Now then, if it gets above 17% before you bottle it, it can. Uh, it can ferment. Oh. But it, when you get it... I say that is because over in Egypt, they found 2,000-year-old honey mm -hmm. still good. They found it in the tombs. Yeah, it, it never goes bad. Now, it may crystallize, and you think, oh, that's going bad. No, it ain't going bad. It's just crystallized. You can actually warm it back up and take it back to liquid honey. Or you can spread it on just like that. It'll have a little crunch to it, but it still tastes good. Uh, and it's still good. Uh, yes, ma'am. The use of over the years of more pesticides in the crop, does that affect the bee population? It does affect it. Uh, if the bees get into it, it can kill them. If they're spraying and the spray drifts into the bee box, it'll kill the whole hive out. Uh, so we, if we've got them somewhere where they're, do I need to stay back a little bit? Uh, if we've got them in a place, say on cotton, if they're going to spray it, we have to know it so we can cover them up or move them. Uh, now some of the seeds have been treated in the cotton and they don't have to spray it as much and that's helped. So, but there's, if you've got neighbors, I've been spraying pasture on a few. Uh, and I have to watch and make sure I don't catch a, I have to catch a day that's not windy and I'm not near the bees. And actually right now I've got all the bees off my place, so it's kind of helping. And all what about areas where they do crop dusting? No, do I? What about areas where they do crop dusting? You just have to get your bees away from You either need to move them or you need to cover them up. Uh, and that's, that's something that, you know, when they're crop dusting, dropping down out of clouds, that you can be hear that back wall or further and still get the over, over spray on it. So yeah, that can get them. And that's one of the other things that kills the bees out. So when the, when the ones get kicked out around winter time. The drones, uh-huh. Yeah, do they die because of the weather? They starve to death. They starve. Okay. Yeah. Gee. Yeah, they're. <laughs> they say, get out of here, you old man. I don't want you anymore. <laughs> the new hornets, uh, the ones that are killing the bees, uh, is there a problem here? No. They kill our hornets or whatever? They've actually, from what I understand, never caught a, swarm, caught a hive or a swarm in the United States. There were some in Canada, and they actually got into a few boxes in the United States. Uh, but it's just, that's one of those deals that it kind of happened, and then you don't hear anything else about it. That's what I read, too. Yeah. I mean, I thought they evidently just put that in the papers, so... Yeah. Start spreading that kind of rumor, so, not worried, it, it actually, worried. they had a few hives that got hit with them, uh, and I say a few, it could have been 100 or 200 or so, I don't know. But it was just a small area. It happened, and oh, they're coming in, they're killing the bees, and then they just never did. So, it's kind of like the African hive bees when they came in. You know, oh, they're moving up north. Well, as they moved, as they replaced the queens, they didn't just mate with Africanized queens, they mated with all the other, I mean, drones, they mated with all the other feral drones, and, or even some of them out of people's hives, I'm sure. Uh, and so you just took that African, went from here to here to here to here. So it's, you still have some that get hot, and they'll holler Africanized bee, and they may be, but a regular, 
B can get hot too. If you take one that doesn't have a queen, you take one that's like this time of year when there's nothing for them to forage on, they get hot. You know, if they're not being fed and taken care of. So they're in, they're in distress, and that's, that's one of their reactions to it. Did you have a question? Yes. I'm trying to figure out how to ask it. <laughs> so the queen has, when does the queen lay eggs? Like around what time of year? She's in the heaviest production. Early spring through midsummer, and then once the dearth hits, the dearth is when it gets 100 degrees, and there's just not any pollen out. I mean, nectar out there for them hardly. Uh, then she will slow down, okay. and then she'll pick back up again in the fall when we start getting more nectar out there with the fall flowers, and then over the winter she'll lay just a little cluster of them throughout the winter a lot of times, or most times. Because you talked about the males getting kicked out, and the females going out and foraging and coming back, but then they die off because so, they wear themselves in, out. In the fall time, and this is Roger, the husband and wife, tape, Roger, when he came in the other night, he talked about that process. I never had really understood it. But the queens that, I mean, the bees that are being born, uh, in the mid to late fall, their process slows down on their development. And I didn't know this until he was telling it the other night. So at different stages, some bees can build wax for comb. Once they pass a certain age, they can't do that. Uh, certain bees feed, certain bees do different things. The way he described it, and I, like I said, I'm sure he's, he knows it, uh, but they'll just kind of freeze in time as far as what their ability is to do something so that they can take care of everything through the winter because the queen's not laying near as many eggs. That was my question. Eggs. Is there ever a point where there are no bees in there because they're either not born or they've all died? That's what we call it as a <laughs> dead hive. <laughs> So yes, I, we get those dead hides about 20 to 30% of the year, mm -hmm. or per year. So, but yes, it's, and that's, that's what I didn't understand until the other night when he was there talking to us about it. Um, so, any? Well, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I will tell you, and and I don't know that you can tell me how, how it was that it happened. I uh, came home, I cannot remember what month it was because oh, that, mm, that, was, that was more than four, four, about 40 years ago, I'll say. Yeah. I came home in my car at straight up midnight and we had one light bulb in the carport. I got out and I had on um, a, a shirt kind of like yours and four bees got on my neck crawled in the shirt and bit me and I went into our bathroom and the husband came in and he killed all four bees mm -hmm. that stung me did he get the stinger out of the stingers oh no I, it was horrible so and if but I was sicker in that period of time with my multiple sclerosis and everybody, and they, you know, my hair was long and everybody said, you know, because my hair was long, maybe that's why they went down. They'll, they'll get up under a woman's hair a lot of times. Oh. And they'll, a lot of times if they get after me, they'll get right back but in here. I'm not sure why. Straight up midnight, how did that even, well, I mean, we, where did they go? Somebody may have been hauling some bees, oh. and they could have come off the truck or whatever, and then they didn't have a place to go. So, so they will go to that light yes. for the warmth, and the, uh, at night they'll go to a light if they get out of the hive. Thank you. The end of my story is finally here. <laughs> oh, wow. 
But no, if you get stung, they leave a stinger in you. And a, a bee will only sting, can only sting you one time because they pull their stinger out when they do. And I'll go ahead and tell you one other story. I did know, I, I was also a, a person who went to other people that had MS. And I went to one house and they had purchased bees and he daily stung his wife. Hypotherapy. With the bees. Uh, she never got that. <laughs> you know, it's just, you don't know if it's going to work or not, yeah, so you try it. Uh, mm. But the stinger, when it, they sting you, you want to get it out as quick as you can because when that stinger's in there, it just sits there and pumps venom into you until it empties, it. unless you can get it scratched out. Mm -hmm. I watched it. Mm -hmm. so. Cool, awesome, thank you. You bet. Fascinating nature about you. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. Oh, thank you guys for coming. Next month is Mark Moreno. He is a professor out at Texas A&M University up in Commerce. He'll be here next month. And we have a lot of events coming up, so keep an eye on that if you guys want to attend any of them. Um, we have a motorcycle race, a gun show, and our miniature golf um, all coming up in the next month. So enjoy. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. This video has been brought to you by Juice. Juice is your community-owned provider for electric, internet, cable TV, and true local programming.